Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to read Chapter 15 of Running Out of Time. We're going to see if um, Jesse ever gets through to Mr. Neely on the phone. We know at the end of Chapter 14 she was having trouble getting a hold of Mr. Neely he, as he didn't answer when she tried to call. So let's see what happens in this chapter. Here we go. Page, one, uh, page 106, please. Jessie stood next to the phone, trying to decide how long she should wait before dialing Mr. Neely's number again, and then she felt the bump from behind. She half turned and saw a man slipping. His limbs jolted outward, his left arm brushed the note from Ma and knocked it to the ground. The force of his fall brought Jessie down, too. "'Oh, excuse me,' the man said. "'You aren't hurt, are you? I'm so clumsy. Looks like I haven't broken in this new pair of feet yet.' Jessie scrambled to her feet, and she looked at the man suspiciously. His fall reminded her of the way Chester Seward and Richard Dunlop sometimes acted during recess at school, you know, knocking girls down by accident so they could look up the girls' skirts. But this man was an adult, and Jessie was wearing pants like a boy. The man picked, Then the man picked up Ma's note and looked at it. No, Jessie wanted to scream. What if the man was from Clifton? Should she run? But she couldn't get help without Ma's note. This must be yours, the man said casually, handing the scrap of paper to Jessie. I'm so sorry. Are you done with the phone? That was really why I walked over here, not to put you in traction. You are all right, aren't you? Y yes, Jessie stammered, clutching the note. The man turned away, looking out, uh, took out a notebook from his jacket and, and seemed to be writing something down. And then he picked up the phone. Jessie backed away from the man, her thoughts jumbled. The man couldn't be from Clifton, because he would have captured her right there, wouldn't he? But why had he knocked her down? Why had he looked at her note? What had he written? Jessie wanted to believe the man had nothing to do with her or Clifton. Still, she couldn't shake her fear. Blindly, she turned and ran. Risking one glance over her shoulder, Jessie saw that the man was still talking on the phone. She kept on. The man had acted so strangely and was dressed so strangely. He wore a blue shirt with an odd strip of flowered cloth hanging down from his neck. But everyone seemed odd to Jessie outside of Clifton. Panting, Jessie slowed down. She couldn't run forever, and she had to keep looking for a phone. Now that she knew they had, now that she knew they had blue signs over them, she she would surely find another one soon and then she'd get help for Katie and the others and she wouldn't have to worry anymore about whether the strange people she saw were or were not on Miles Clifton's side. But Jessie walked miles without seeing another one of the blue phone signs. She wondered if she should have stayed at the phone at the stopping point in spite of the strange man. She worried about the puzzle. Even Ma didn't understand. Why did anyone want the children of Clifton to die of diphtheria? Mrs. Sperning, the guide for the tourists back at Clifton, had said Clifton residents got medical care, so the tourists must not care if Clifton was totally authentic. How could anyone want Katie, sweet little Katie, to die, or Betsy Benton, or any of the Clifton children? Jessie blinked back tears and walked faster. She had to find a phone. When she got hungry again, she didn't stop but pulled a hunk of bread out of her pack and ate while she walked. She paused only for a moment to gulp down the last of the papaya juice. It left a too uh, sweet taste in her mouth. She longed for ordinary water, but the fat environmentalist warning about poison water made her leery of drinking from any of the streams she crossed. Anyhow, there wasn't time to stop. Jessie passed woods almost as dense as those around Clifton and felt slightly better because that meant the Clifton woods weren't the last place weren't the last in the world after a few miles though the landscape flattened out and there were no more trees or hills to remind her of home except for the ditches on each side of the big road the land was almost perfectly level long fences marked off enormous fields Jessie recognized small corn plants growing in even rows in one of the fields she marveled and the farmer who could plant so much. Mr. Atkins, who had the biggest fields in Clifton, only planted 20 rows of corn each spring, and he bragged about it. This field had hundreds, and then there was another field just like it. People must work really hard out here, Jessie thought. She hated hoeing, just the little field that Pa kept. Jessie's legs felt rubbery, just like they did after a long day of hoeing corn. She was sure she had been walking for hours. The sun was sinking low in the sky now, and Clifton School would have been out long ago, and all the children in the village would be doing their chores. Jessie wondered if Hannah had to do Jessie's and Katie's chores as well as her own. Bet she was complaining. Jessie grinned at the thought of Hannah having to do everything, but 
Hannah wouldn't be any good helping Ma on her sick rounds. Hannah didn't even like to hear someone sneeze. Ma would probably run herself ragged tonight trying to help all the sick children, but from what Ma had said, she couldn't do much. She was counting on Jessie to bring the cure. Jessie looked around frantically searching for one of the blue phone signs. What if she didn't find a phone and reach Mr. Neely before dark? And what if she had to walk all the way to Indianapolis? To distract herself, Jessie tried to remember everything she knew about the state's capital. Reverend Holloway had been there and sometimes talked about what a sinful place it was. It was founded on a lie, he said. Then, uh, when he was around, though, Pa and some of the other men in Clifton laughed about how the settlers near Indianapolis had tricked the state about 15 years ago. Not long before Clifton was founded, the state decided the capital should be in the middle of Indiana, not down by the Ohio River in Corydon. So the state officials sent scouts up, and settlers around Indianapolis told the scouts what a great place Indianapolis was, because it was easily reached uh, on the White River, except boats couldn't go that far up the White River. You could only get to Indianapolis by stagecoach, and everyone knew that was hard. Well, those settler, settlers fooled the state, but now we're stuck with the capital They'll, that'll never amount to anything, Pa always said when the others laughed too hard. Jessie tried to remember what else she had heard. It seemed there wasn't anything in Indianapolis except the legislator building and a couple others. Maybe there were more now, or maybe there were fewer. Ma hadn't said whether Indianapolis was still the capital in 1996. Jessie kept walking. Soon she could tell from the angle of the setting of the sun that the road was turning more to the east. Was that a problem? Ma had said the road went all the way to Indianapolis, but that had been years ago, and maybe they'd moved the road, or... Jessie rounded a curve and saw an odd set of lights hanging over the road. While she watched, a green light at the bottom went out and was replaced by a yellow light above it. Then the yellow light went out and the red light came on. The cars that had breezed by Jessie screeched to a stop before the red light. Jessie stared. Now, how did that work? There there didn't seem to be anyone around to change the lights. And Looking, uh, looking around curiously, Jessie saw a sight that made her forget the lights. Off to the left, just beyond the road, was a cluster of about 30 houses and other buildings. Jessie must have walked further than she thought. This had to be Indianapolis. Jessie was so excited she didn't see the brown car until it almost until it was almost beside her. It was going the wrong way, backward. A boy with greasy hair sprang out. Get in, he yelled to Jessie. All right, somebody is trying to pick Jesse up. So let's see what happen, happens in chapter 16.